Lori, why don't you take it from here? Um, we had the privilege of meeting a lot of Hondurans, visiting several homes of families that Ralph and Alita work with, and hearing a lot of stories from Ralph and Alita because they keep track of the people uh, that they work with. And I have to say that of all the things we saw and did while we were in Honduras, this was probably the area that was most grieving uh, and heavy. It left you with a very heavy heart and, and a lot of feeling like, how do I process this? Because um, there is just a deep, I, hard to find the right words for it, there's a deep brokenness in people and in families in Honduras. And when you visit them in their homes, you begin to see some of that brokenness. There are few people who actually legally get married. Most people in this area are just living together. Um, so there's not a lot of respect for the whole idea of marriage and commitment and family. Uh, men often move from family to family to family. So they'll, they'll live with a woman, they'll have two or three children, and then when he gets tired of that, he moves on to another woman, establishes a second family. There were many men that we met that ha were on their second or third family while we were there. Um, girls, sadly, often drop out of school um, many times when they're 14. And they end up living with a man and having a baby. And you discover that all of these things are contractual. So um, everything in Honduras is contractual. I do something for you, you do something for me. There's some sort of benefit on both sides. And so um, this system, uh, including relationships where a, a woman will, or a young woman, will get involved with a man and have a baby because that ties that man to her for at least a little while and she has a home and some temporary security um, in some way. And, and so, and, and for many of these girls, having a baby is kind of a cover for the shame of dropping out of school. They don't want to be in school anymore. School is hard for them, or various reasons. In fact, one of the days that we were there, um, Alita and I were talking with some families and at the food distribution, and I will be telling you about the sponsorship program and distribution later, but she came in with a sibling and her father. And it was, of course, unusual that her father was with her, but... Um, she came to tell Alita that she was dropping out of school, and she was probably 14, 13, 14, somewhere along there. And, um, and when you drop out of school, you can no longer be in the sponsorship program. And so Alita was like, well, why, pressing her to say why, and she kind of hung her head, and she wouldn't meet Alita's eyes, and um, Alita was trying to get the girl to explain why she was dropping out of school, and after some uh, gentle persuasion, the girl finally said that she was living with a boy or a young man. And, um, and was going to have a baby, and, and just that was her life. And that was so many people's lives that this is a pattern that is perpetuated um, among so many children. And that's just one story. Alita could probably tell 10 or 15 of those stories of kids that they've worked with, girl, young girls who drop out of school and, and live with a man. And so there are vast numbers of single mothers with multiple children by multiple fathers. And in fact, that, that family structure, single moms with multiple children by multiple men, far outweighs any other type of family structure in the area that we, where, where Ralph and Alita are, are working. And of course, as you would guess, this um, lack of respect for marriage, the commitment of family, the breakdown of the family structure is going to lead, one of the major factors, that leads to a level of abject poverty that we don't really see. Um, and, and so I have some pictures to show. This is one of the homes that we went to. That, that actually looks better than some of the ones that we had, because they had metal. And of course, as Kurt said, when the rain comes down, it's torrential rain. And for people who live in a shack with a dirt floor, um, the next picture shows um, most of them have basically a pit toilet. They might have a little surrounding tarp or something. You can see there's a broken down water filter in front. Some people don't even have water filters. And what, that's one thing that Ralph and Alita do is they go into some of the more remote areas, bringing a simple um, five gallon bucket water filtering system that they install for families. Um, one day we got to go visit some people in their homes, and one of the women we visited was a woman named Ava. In order to get to Ava's home, we had to go down a 
rather steep ravine with roots and rocks and mud to get down to a river. At the river, we had to figure out how to get across the river, so we're all taking our socks and shoes off. And all the little kids, Honduran kids, are just hopping and skipping right across the river. <laughs> we're like, how do we get across this thing? And so they kind of lined up to give us a handhold, got across the river, and then you can see there were big boulders that you had to kind of jump from boulder to boulder, climb up another ravine on the other side, um, kind of holding it on to uh, vines and various things to get your way up to the top to get to the shack where Ava lives. And um, you can see a, this is her kitchen. And she's cooking over a fire. And, the, the, and you can see there's just kind of, it's a, kind of an open air thing. And the next picture shows Ava's daughter, Ada, inside their living quarters. And basically their living quarters is a small room where they have several mattresses to sleep on and their belongings piled up. There really isn't furniture or things like that. Um, and, uh, and then the next picture shows Ava's mother, the grandmother of the family, who also lives with them, and she's doing her laundry. And I don't know about you, but I'm so glad I don't have to do laundry like that. It, she has a rock, a stone area, washing area called a pila, and she has her laundry in five gallon buckets and a bar of soap, and she's scrubbing her laundry um, for the family there and then of course the next picture shows that they were hanging uh, the laundry up outside their shack and of course this day that we were there we had three days with rain and um, this day the sun had come out and everybody was out doing their laundry on that day because then you can hang your your uh, your clean laundry up and uh, when we were done visiting this family we kind of scrambled our way down the ravine and back across the river and before I know it I look over and there was Ava five months pregnant scrambling up and down the same ravine that we had just come up and down. And that is the only way to get to her home. Um, she does it because she has to. If she wants to go to the store or anything that she needs to do, she has to scramble down the, the rocky ravine, cross the river, and scramble up the other side. And the sad part of that story is that her previous pregnancy, um, when she was about six months, I think, along, she fell down that ravine and lost her baby. And so th these are the kinds of tragic stories that living in this kind of poverty with this kind of brokenness in families leads to. Um, we also that day visited another home in, a, in another area, and uh, you had to cross a little board bridge to get there, and Kurt was enjoying his, I don't know, his gymnastics moment there. <laughs> um, I, I, I was not quite as free and easy as I was crossing them. But there were dogs that were we had to pass by, and we're, Ralph said, you know, watch out for the dogs. We all have a stick. And getting to a home of a family where they were checking to see if the child in the family was going to continue going to school so that they could continue the sponsorship program. And this is the inside. This was a single room um, home, and this is the inside of their home. And then there's a picture. All of the little Honduran children are full of smiles and hugs. They're happy to have you take their picture, and then they want to see it on your phone. And, uh, and it was a joy to see them. And then the final visit, we, we had several others, but that I'm going to share with you is visiting um, Ralph and Alita's neighbors, Walter and Tonya. And this is us, again, trying to navigate the, this was a little easier, because there were actual steps of tires and boards and rocks and cement blocks that you kind of, I, I really can't imagine doing this with the rain. But Walter and Tony have three little boys. And so the little boys are up and down navigating this. And they greeted, the, their little boy greeted us with a tail of a reptile on the steps. And I was like, oh dear, what's that? And <laughs> he was all excited to show us his treasure. And, um, and when we got up there, Walter showed us here. And you can't really see, it's not a great picture. But Walter is a, a sharpshooter with a slingshot. And quite a distance across a ravine, he had been able to um, kill an iguana, and that was going to be their supper, iguana stew. <laughs> and so um, we enjoyed our visit with Walter and Tonya and their three boys um, before coming home. But speaking of Walter and eating iguanas, there's a couple pictures to show you of some of the delicious Honduran food that we were able to enjoy. Um, Kurt had mentioned baleadas. It's a traditional Honduran dish. It's homemade tortilla, which is delicious filled with rice and beans, or filled with beans and cheese and eggs and avocado. And when you go out for baleadas, it's about $1. So all four of us got baleadas. Um, and they're quite big. They fill up the plate. And went out to eat for about, 
four to five dollars uh, on one time. Another time we went out to eat, and this is also a very uh, traditional Honduran dish called pollo chuco. And pollo chuco is, I, I liken it to kind of a Honduran poutine. So, you know, in poutine you would have fries and cheese curds and gravy and that sort of thing. Well, this is fried plantains on the bottom, and then there's some delicious fried chicken underneath the, the plantains, and then there's kind of a slaw on top of it, uh, a lot of sauces that they put on the whole thing, and then the pickled red onions on top. And Kurt and uh, myself and Ralph and Alita, and that plate doesn't really do it justice because it was, it was just an enormous mound, stuck up really high. And again, that, that plate of, of Pollachuco is about $4, so um, very inexpensive. Um, Kerr was living a little on the wild side while we were there. You know, if you know him at all, you know he's not a super adventurous eater. Um, but, but we're living near the, uh, the ocean, and so f fish and seafood is nice and fresh. And so that day he, he, he decided to have a fish dish, and it came as a whole fish on his plate. And, but he thoroughly enjoyed it. And, um, and then uh, the last two pictures are, one, we stopped at a fruit stand to get a Honduran fruit um, called lichas. And um, they are, <laughs> I think, well, they are they're kind of have a hairy, uh, thick coating, and you dig your fingers in and split them apart, and the next picture kind of shows there's an inner fruit with a pit, and you just put, pop it in your mouth, and it tastes kind of like a grape. They're actually really delicious. They look kind of weird, but they're really delicious, and I found that I really liked leeches, but I'm sad to say that leeches really did not like me. <laughs> so I, if I'm not mistaken, that might be the source of some ongoing trouble, um, but, I was, but I was very glad that I didn't have to eat iguana stew.